minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Do more in the future? Trap yes. Talk podcasts? Yes. Man. Only, only Trap Talk. Exclusive. Yes. Exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> oh. So stop calling us. From the spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the crop, gotta love it, love it or not. I'm hot from the hop to the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the club to spot, get the club to pop. When I come up with the everybody. You are now tapped into the coolest reptile podcast in the world, coming live and direct from the most infamous Tinley NARBC with the most infamous reptile shipping company in the game, the real OG shipping reptiles with the real OG Chad Brown. What's up, buddy? What's up, my man? Happy Tinley. Happy Tinley to you. This is uh, this is cool, man. I'm happy to do this. We're in the Keep Your Reptiles booth, so it's, uh, this is a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I just don't say I'm the OG. My, my shirt says we're the OG. That's what makes it official. I'm yes. telling you guys right now. Hey, listen, if this is your first time tapping in, do me a favor. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Smash that notification bell. Drop a comment. Let me know what you like best out of this amazing series that we're doing here with Chad Brown and all his friends that support Ship the Reptiles. Let's be honest, man. We're talking legendary keepers in the game who choose you guys over anyone else. How does that feel? It feels great. It feels great. You know, um, you – do your best as a company to, you know, put your passion into what you do. Right. Um, then you meet up with other folks who all have their passion in whatever space of the hobby that they're in, and they choose you. Um, it's very flattering. It's right. humbling. And so I don't take it lightly. My staff doesn't take it very lightly. We're very dedicated and serious to upholding the standards and the level of service that those kind of folks who are going to be on the show a little bit later that they expect and they demand. Now, i got to ask you, man. I mean, I, I understand – the name real OG, but I don't think you guys take that lightly because that's a name that has been given to you based off the respect and dedication that you've had through the decades in this industry. How do you guys determine to stay on top and, and just stay a bit ahead of the curve? I mean, how are you to limit, like, keeping you guys separate from the competition? I mean, there's always going to be competition. Right. And in the end, um, my head's got to be down, focused on us and, and what we do right. and the service that we deliver to our customers. Right. So my customer service staff, they recognize it. They are the difference, you know, uh, for the most part, everyone in this industry uses FedEx as a shipping partner. Right. So we are all selling FedEx labels. Right. But in the end, the customer service that we provide, um, I think is what sets us apart. We have the largest customer service staff of any of the shipping companies, the most dedicated staff are all animal people, animal keepers. Right. Um, and so these personal relationships that my staff is able to make with vendors and shippers all around the country, uh, I think that's one of the big differences. Also, we... Being the OG, no one has more experience than what we have. Right. No one has stronger ties to FedEx. No one has a longer relationship to, to FedEx than we do. So the, the long track record of experience, uh, you couple that with the passion and dedication, you couple that with high level of customer service, you couple that with the biggest team, the most experienced team in the right. business, you'd be really 
still need to go someplace else. Right. I mean, I, team is everything, right? You are, you know that being right. an ex NFL player. Yeah. Um, what, what are the? I mean, talks of you going to the Hall of Fame. Is that is that is that in the works? Is that? I mean, what's going on with that? All right. So this was the first year that I was officially nominated to the NFL Hall Beautiful. of Fame. Wow. So, um, you know, talk about humbling. I mean, just 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 that is an honor, you would say, right? Right. You know, well, that's what they say at the Academy Awards. You know, it's an <laughs> honor just to be nominated. So the fact that I've been nominated. Um, I've had some conversations with some folks who are involved in the voting process. Right. You know, I'm not some kind of awesome slam dunk to get in first thing, first ballot kind of guy. Right. It'll take some years for my candidacy to, you know, develop. We'll see if it happens. But uh, I'm honored. Um, for me to be one of just the nominees is incredible. Um, I grew up, uh, you know, very shy kid who loved football because you put on the helmet. Right. And it's not really me. That's just this superhero version of myself right who used football as this escape from his own personal level of shyness i got the chance to go out there and do what i did um and now folks are recognizing that um again it's, it's incredibly humbling i mean for anyone out there spending uh their time here at the show maybe who's even watching this now you know here's the thing a lot of people fly into this show but a lot of people don't know that if you buy an animal here at the show we could send it to you absolutely and tell us how that works it's pretty simple so yeah Coming from, this is one of the bigger destination shows. Some of the shows are more regional shows right. um, where folks just kind of drive in. But this show, Tinley Park in the fall, um, Daytona, are, folks, are shows where folks actually fly into the show from across the country. And they want to go around and be able to buy animals, whether they're buying animals to supply their pet store or they're you know buying animals for their own personal collection. How do I get these back? We come to the Ship Reptiles booth. We've got everything you could possibly need. We've got the boxes, the snake bags, the deli covers, the peak pack, the heat packs, the cold packs, the face packs, everything you need. And then we can process your label right here at our table. And then on Monday morning, I'll meet the FedEx truck here at the show, and they'll be delivered to you on Tuesday morning. So wow. we try to make this process as seamless as possible. We've been doing this for years and years and years, vending from the shows, selling shipping at the shows for the purpose of getting animals for the purchase at the show home to their customers. For anyone out there, Chad, I mean, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a noob in the game. I've only been in the game for like less than six years. So a lot of learning curves I'm still figuring out. One of the biggest things I hate to see people go through is, is a shipping error. Um, some advice for anyone out there shipping for the first time. I mean, what are some first things, like first no-nos or I guess mistakes that people make when they ship a reptile? Um, anything, any advice out there for oh, anyone else? Yeah, tons of advice. Tons of advice. Okay. It's a daunting process. I understand anyone who's got uh, a little fear about this process. You have taking this baby that you've hatched, you know, that you put all your passion and love into, and now you got to send it out and stick it in a box and trust somebody else to deliver that. So there's some things that you can certainly do to make this process easier. The number one killer of reptiles in the shipping process is improper heat packings, right. more so than anything else. So everyone assumes, well, it's a reptile. Right. They like it hot. So let's take a heat pack and put it right next to the animal. Well, heat pack's going to spike about 140, 160 degrees. Right. That's going to be hot enough to kill your animal. Easily. Easy. So if you get a, a ball python, you put in a deli cup, and you put that deli cup right on top of your, your, your heat pack, you've cooked your ball python within a, three or four hours. So I, mean, I see you rolling your eyes because, I mean, it's, it's, it sucks. It, it sucks. It, yeah, but, and, and for the most part, they don't know better. They think they're doing the right thing, like, yes. especially when it's a little nipply outside, right? Yeah. So, the you know, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So folks have some good wow. intentions. Right. You know, their, their thought process, their thinking is good, but in the end, that's those good intentions end up hurting the animal. So uh, improper heat pack use is number one. There's definitely tons of FAQs uh, on our site where you can read about proper heat pack use. We've got some videos we'll be putting out shortly um, that I filmed uh, about a month ago that we'll be discussing heat pack use. After that, pay attention to the weather parameters. Um, and if you've got any concerns about weather parameters, you can contact us at Ship Your Reptiles. Give right. us a call, shoot us an email. We'll tell you if you're safe, if you're safe to ship considering the weather where your animal's coming from and where it's going to. Um, also, you know, the, the are, should I use a heat pack? Should I not use a heat pack in the summer? Should I use a cold pack? Should I not use a cold pack? All those kind of questions, please hit us up. We're, we're here to guide you on that. I don't want you to make a decision on your own if you're a novice. You know, we are here to help you out with all of that. And it's also helpful to check the banners on our website. If FedEx is having a an issue with uh, a certain hub, which can have domino effect on deliveries all across the country all those all that information is going to be available on, on our website so you are not going to be going at this alone you're really going to be going at this with all our help another big 
thing I'm looking forward to talk to you right now about, Chad, is, you know, as much as, and you know this, I mean, you're, this Ship to Reptiles is a global sensation. Like, people who love reptiles all around know about you. Me having the coolest reptile podcast in the world, people know me around worldwide. So what I'm saying is I'm meeting people who would just have so many questions about how do you ship to my country or, like, any as far as international shipping. Like, how does that work with Ship to Reptiles? All right, so international shipping is a tough nut to crack. Right. Um, there's lots of paperwork. Right. There's usually about somewhere between eight hundred and a thousand dollars just in paperwork alone, not even including the shipping costs. Wow. So the export thing is very expensive. Okay. So typically, what you want to do is you want to get included in a large export. Where there's lots of animals, so it brings the cost per animal down on the shipping. Okay, you're going to ship over to Europe. You know, you're going to ship in a shipment of fifty animals. Now we've gone from twelve hundred dollars for one animal. Now we've brought it down to maybe fifty, sixty bucks per animal if you do it as a large shipment. At this, at this point in time, Shipping Reptiles does not do international shipping. We have uh, beginning to make some inroads into that market. Hopefully, we can launch that in the next uh, six months to a year or so. Um, but it's a fairly difficult nut to, to crack, but uh, it can be done. We do have an international shipping partner. If you need to ship right away internationally, we can help you out with that. But just know, uh, don't be blown away by the sticker shock when you're quoted with just you know $800 in paperwork, right. much less the shipping fees included. That's what people understand. Like, you know, I understand you might want to buy this one snake, but that one snake's gonna come with eight to a thousand dollars, eight hundred to a thousand dollars worth of paperwork. You yes. know what I mean? So how bad do you want it? I mean, it's it's doable, but it takes time, it's paperwork, and it's and think about it, you're shipping this thing overseas. Right. A lot of things go wrong. Yeah. So I mean there's 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 you have to get a vet check. Right. The animal has to be uh, cleared by fish and wildlife, it has to be cleared by the fish and wildlife service in that country of origin. So all those things are important. What species are you shipping? Are they a sighting species? Do you need a, a master sighting paperwork from fish and wildlife? So there's multiple pieces to the puzzle. That's why there's a lot of cost involved from a paperwork standpoint. Um, we don't make a lot, we don't make any money on the paperwork, only right. on the shipping. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I get emails daily and phone calls daily about folks wanting to either import an animal or export an animal internationally. Um, and most are blown away by the cost involved, so it tends to make people turn away from it. Uh, in the future, I would like to have a regular international shipment schedule right. where I can pull up shipments for customers and then charge people on a portion for their animal that's included. If it's a hundred animal shipment, then it's maybe only a hundred bucks per animal. Right. You know, is it, is it ten animals? You know, all that needs to be figured out. Um, would you say that mostly, Chad, with um, the direction things are headed? Do you feel like, okay, first and foremost, I want to slow down. You know, rodents, a big part of what we do, you know, rodents are the produce for our snakes. Right. At one point, there were people who could ship live rodents. Mm -hmm. Is that something that could possibly happen ever again? Or is that just something where, due to laws, it's probably never going to happen again? If you're going to ship live rodents, they got to go air cargo. Air cargo. Yes. So it's certainly possible within air cargo as an inconvenience of somebody's got to drive to the airport and right. drop it off. Right. If you on your end, you got to go drive to the airport and pick it up. So... Uh, FedEx delivering live rodents to you is just not going to happen. The FedEx system is not built for mammals. Right. Um, so you got to go some air cargo, some other option for live mammals, basically. What would you say the biggest trending thing in the reptile industry is right now, animal wise? Like, I mean, out of everything that you guys are sending, is it geckos, ball pythons? What's the hottest thing right now? Gosh, I mean, you know, it, it always changes. There's a significant uh, interest in crested geckos right. over in Asia. So we are frequently seeing, you know, uh, Folks from Asia come over to the shows, um, get one of those VIP passes that come in early, and walk around to every crested gecko breeder and cherry pick those geckos. And they show up at my table to you know ship out a couple hundred geckos that they purchase to an exporter that's going to export them back over to Korea, for example. Right. Um, so that's a, a definitely a big trend that I've seen in the last maybe year or so um, is growing interest in other countries for very specific niche animals. Um, crested geckos being one of those. Um, but man, you know, the, the, the cycle of animals is ever changing. Right. Clearly, ball pythons are a staple in our in our, in our industry. Right. Um, but, you know, for a while, colubras were hot. You know, Mexican black king snakes were 350 bucks each. Right. When, you know, back in my day, I, I couldn't give them away for $25. <laughs> so the, the cycles are always going to turn over. Um, I, I'm beginning to see the, uh, maybe a growing resurgence in some of the Asian rat snake market. Um, a lot of stuff that I did 20 years ago. The cocci, the porphyracea, the valenti, the pulchra, the rhino rat snakes, the mandarins. I'm seeing those starting to come back. So uh, I, I don't know if I've got a, a crystal ball where I can tell you what's the next greatest hot thing. Um, but just know 
if you're in this game long enough, you know things are going to change. And for anyone out there, because I don't know how much you've heard about this going on, mainly in the ball python community, just like a recession, right? People not selling stuff and people going through uh, some sort of a slump right now. I mean, are you seeing any kind of uh, decline in ball pythons being shipped? Well, decline is an odd word because I think if you compare today's market to what was happening during COVID when people were getting stimulus checks, yeah, the market has changed considerably. Uh, the, the, the market has changed considerably. Um, so numbers are down uh, right. because, you know, people aren't getting stimulus checks anymore. Um, yeah. and then I think there's a bit of a, a glut on the market. People were like, oh, I'm selling this, this many animals during COVID, therefore I've got to ramp up production. Well, the market has cooled a bit, and that's always going to be the case. We're always going to be in a, you know, accelerated market and a slowing down market, and it's going to vary from species to species. Um, but the, those folks who have a, a savvy business mind, those folks who have the true passion for the hobby, are going to be folks who are going to be here five years, ten years, fifteen years from now. Okay. Um, I wish I could really just take up all this time, but I can't. I have a wrap-up question for Chad before we let our first guest sit down with them. And, man, this guy dressed a profession. For anyone out there curious, wondering what your true attachment is to the animals, like what was it with you? Was it was a childhood experience? Have you told me a little bit what you used to do herping-wise in L.A. County? Right. Um, so let's talk about – tell us a little bit of breakdown with that. All right, so I grew up in, in Southern California. I grew up in the Pasadena area, the Altadena area, which you know is bordered by all these hillsides. Um, so I could go in my backyard and I could catch uh, – California king snakes, garter snakes, uh, all types of fence lizards, alligator lizards, frogs, toads of various types, salamanders. Right. Um, so this was all part of my backyard, my grown up experience. Right. So I grew up in California, a city boy, but also kind of grew up a little bit of a country boy at the same time. Okay. Um, so I got to the University of Colorado. Okay. I was out of my mom's house. My mom said, no snakes in the house, like a lot of moms. Just all moms. Shout out to moms, man. Which, which is interesting because for my 12th birthday, my mom bought me a Mexican red knee tarantula. So tarantulas <laughs> were okay, but snakes were not. At any rate, how that works. yeah, uh, I met a friend uh, in the dorms at the University of Colorado who had a boa for sale. Right, that was my first real reptile that I had caught out in the wild. Um, and I, then I met Cameron DePedlin from Bushmaster Reptiles right. at a you. local pet store there in Boulder, Colorado, where the University of Colorado is. Right, and uh, Cameron was great, invited me to his house, had a chance to meet him, see the snakes that he was breeding in his extra bedroom, in his basement, in his backyard. I was like, oh my gosh, yeah. this is a whole Thing. brand new yeah. world to me. This is <laughs> mind blowing. As a scholarship athlete, um, you're not allowed to have a job during the school year. Right. So I thought, ooh, let me pair up these animals and sell the babies. I can make some money and the NCAA will never know. So I started pairing up my animals. I paired up my leopard geckos. I paired up my California king snakes. I paired up my bows. And every spring I would produce animals right. and I would sell them to local pet stores in Boulder. I would sell them to local students on campus. I would put a few thousand dollars in my pocket for a college student. I thought I was like the king of the planet. Wow. Um, and that's kind of where this whole thing got started. So that's where the, the, the passion right. and the growth came from. And then once I got in the NFL, I had some money in my pocket. I built probes out of two reptiles. Right. And we grew to be one of the largest producers of captive red reptiles on the planet. So during your whole career in the NFL, you had this dream going on. Like this was this was also brewing while you're making a legacy for you, yourself in the NFL. Yes, at the same time. yes. So, you know, <laughs> I, I would play the six months of the NFL season. Right. And as soon as the season was over, I wanted to get back to the warehouse and right. dive into that. Right. Um, so over the course of Pro Exotics, uh, we bred 85 different species and subspecies of reptile. Okay. So if it's a boa type, we probably bred it. If it's a python type, we've probably bred it. Right. If it's some kind of colubrid, we bred it. I, I, you know, the Asian rat snakes we did. Uh, geckos. This is Pro Exotic days. Pro Exotic days. Right. So everything from Lichianus to Crested to... Giant bentos to fat tails to leopards to little pictus geckos wow. to uh, felsuma, all the grandest and all that stuff. Killing uh, it, naming these Palomahera giant geckos. Uh, you know, I mean, you name it. Uh, flying geckos, you name it. At some point, we we bred it. Uh, monitor lizards, right. uh, black throats, white throats, green trees, black trees, right. um, <laughs> yellow trees. I mean, at some point, we've worked with all and bred most of the species: turtles, tortoises, frogs. Right. So uh, we had a retail store. We had our, you know, our, our price list. We bought and sold other people's animals. Then we focused as a dedicated breeder of only on, and seller of our stuff. Right. Um, so the, the passion has been long. It's been deep. It's gone on for a long time. Well, man, it's very inspiring. I got to say, Chad, but we have somebody here ready to sit down with you. Uh, the man who's been locked up for 24 hours inside the NARBC Tidley. How to make his own clothes by hand. Sitting down with Chad next, we have Garrett Hartle from Reach Out Reptiles. Let's Yay! go, Garrett Hartle. Come on, buddy. Have a seat. Make sure you show off your outfit, please. 
Can you see it? Let's see. I the pants are the best part. You got to come a little bit closer in camera. There you go. Yeah, we, we get the top, but I don't know if you can get the, get the pants. Oh, you're not gonna get the pants, but the pants is the best part. The pants are the best part. Wow. For those who know what snake bags are, Garrett has crafted pants out of shipping reptile snake bags. Yeah. The the MGM ingenuity, picture, the ingenuity the is off here. the charts. Yeah. The dedication to the role is off the charts. Nice. Twenty four hours. You got only got what uh, about four or five hours left? A couple hours left. We're we're right there at the end. So. Okay, so uh, Garrett, the I won't call them stunts because stunts yes. imply something corny. The uh, I mean, this is pretty corny, honestly. Come on now. But the the the, the quirky things you are willing to do. Okay. To raise awareness for your company, yes. to raise money for for USR. Sure. Uh, at the yeah. Anaheim show, was it last year? I think it was yeah. last year. You started off with an isopod that I caught in my sister's backyard. You caught in your sister's backyard that ended up generating. Uh, I think I paid seven thousand dollars for the set of ball pythons, for the pair of ball pythons. We traded up to pretty much one of the more expensive pair of ball pythons in the show. How many trades did it take to get to that? Oh, those ball pythons. You'd have to go back and watch the video. It was something like 16 or 18. Trades. Okay, yeah. So from an isopod to a triple pet pair of ball pythons, I think one of them exhibited some visual trait as well. Um, I think so, yeah. It was yeah. Like an NG triple head. What, what were they? They were uh, sunset clown albinos. Yes. Yeah. Some, so some bananas snakes are going to come out of that pairing, but. Uh, the dedication that you show to these kinds of stunts is off stars. I don't know anybody else in the hobby quite as dedicated as you are. Yeah, I don't Where does that know. come from? Uh, I, I was born with that, I guess. I don't know. I, you know, the thing is, we have a very serious business. You know us. Right. We take our, like, bloodline super seriously. Right. We're, like, bleeding cutting edge of whatever we're trying to do all the time. We're always push, push, push. So you got to blow off steam somehow, you know what I mean? You can't take yourself too seriously. It's, yeah, it's, this is a, a strange hobby because, you know, we take shipping incredibly seriously. Um, it's it's our passion. It's how we make money. It's how we help our customers. We want to be our customers' business partners. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we have fun shirts, you know, snakes on planes. Absolutely. Call ourselves the OG. You, you know, you got your reach out reptile I'm, I'm poncho. poncho samurai gear going over there. <laughs> That's it. Um, so the, the serious nature mixed with the good humor is, is definitely a lot of fun. Um, the super dwarf segment of the hobby that you have come to almost originate and then dominate where the passion for that come from you know it's funny uh i i've always loved reptiles i was in one of those families where my mom hated snakes so i was never allowed to have any <clears throat> so i'd catch whatever i could outside and hide it from her as long as i could right and i ended up getting uh the the very first exotic snake i had was like a carpet python and it opened the floodgates i was like mom christmas birthday for the rest of my life and i'll buy it myself just let me have one right so i think it was nij and then shortly after that my second snake was a jampea which they were importing them back then it was pretty cheap and uh yeah i don't know it's just all been retakes i've loved everything else but it's it's that species i kept circling back around to you know you're like try this try this try this try this and then after a while you have something you're like i like this guy but it's not a super dwarf or a dwarf retake so yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I I've loved them forever. So you remember, or you you may remember that import of Kiowatis. Yes, it was. I was going to ask the question. Yes, that yeah, was one of the first like known locality mm -hmm. super dwarfs brought into the country, and uh, you had those. We ended up getting some snakes from those, and I still have today because I I had bred them, produced, sold them off. But I always keep in contact with everyone. I love seeing my like snake brand babies and right. all that. So we circle back around. I still have stuff that's like twenty five percent from that bloodline, fifty percent from that bloodline. Uh, yes. So a long standing source of pride for me has been when stories like that come up. When an animal that has passed through my hands has gone to someone else, whether it was an animal that you know I was I bought and thought well, this is really cool and I'll sell it to somebody, or I bred myself, um, and to see. Bloodlines that were in my hands continue to live on. Um, it's, I was just talking to MJ, how humbling that is, you know, to be a part of the hobby as long as I've been, um, but to see the tentacles of some of my work continue on is, is just, it's, it's awesome, man. And so, you know what it is, though? It's like you connect with people in this industry at some point, somehow, for some reason. 
and then you see their love, dedication, and passion and stuff, and then it becomes infectious. So, like, I loved Pro Exotics. I like the Jamaican theme. A lot of my family's actually right. Jamaican and stuff. You got those, like, Rasta colors right. on everything. I still got my, like, old school temp gun. Nice. I saw some at the show over right. here for yeah. sale. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, all the stuff that I hadn't had when you were into the crazy striped red blood mm -hmm. pythons, uh, you were doing all the water monitors back then, kind of, mm -hmm. like, beefing them up for mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, everything that you guys were working with, even, like, I never did the Thai bamboo rat snakes or anything, but those obs more obscure colubrids right. have kind of translated now into these African house snakes for me. Which I'm so jealous of. Yeah. Because that was one of the projects I wanted to take on that I couldn't get agreement within the company to do. So it's, it's kind of fun to live vicariously through you. So when I see those African house snakes posted on your social media, I'm like, oh, man. They are fun. I would have loved to have done those, you know, because I was yeah. always into those slightly weird, offbeat animals. Yeah, that's the one that got away. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, they're very cool. So, but that's, that's what it is. Like, so I've been heavily influenced. Like when I was a kid, Bob Applegate, yep. uh, you actually have my favorite beaded lizard. Yep. I, I found Fernando. out, yep. which I only learned that like last year. I was like, no way. I love Fernando. So, but yeah, Bob Applegate, uh, Dan Maliri, yourself, yep. you know, and a few other people, you know, were, were key parts to my getting into reptiles and it kind of shapes the way you do business. Like you said, you guys are, are very professional, but a lot of fun at the mm -hmm. same time and stuff like that so i don't know i think that's just what i grew up seeing and learning from and try to do it my own so, so from a time frame perspective uh the the kaiwadi retics how long ago was that uh, i was early 2000s okay so we're probably 20 years ago yeah where you know our paths cross somewhere with the kaiwadi retics and now you're a customer Right, and, and now we're, we're, we're and still now we're, partners, in some and we're way. shipping Kiowatis that descended from your stuff with your labels on. Are you kidding? I mean, how awesome yeah. is that? No, Are you kidding really me? Cool. So really yeah, cool. to have moved from the competitive nature of being a breeder, because there's always competition among breeders, sure. to now being a business partner where I can enjoy your success. Yeah. Because if I was still into breeding, I'd be like, oh man, he's got those African house snakes. I want those. Yeah. Or oh, he's in. He's he's doing the super dwarf thing. I should have gotten into that ten years ago. Now I can just enjoy your success and be your shipping partner and help you grow your business. Yeah, which yeah. is great. Which is great. I I feel the same kind of thing when you know customers of ours have their first clutches. And I'm the first one they send sent them pictures yeah. to. Yeah. And you know a lot of times they're they're just really happy. They want to share. They know that you love the stuff as much as they do. So they're like, can I give you a baby from this? Yeah. And I was like, dude, if you do, I'll keep it forever. You right. know what I mean? Right. Just, you know, encouraging those kind of people. And, and like you said, building up the community. And people do need to, like, we all support each other ultimately. If I'm championing my part, you're championing your part. Like, without good shipping, we can't have an industry. Right. Without people finding these new, you know, a lot the superdors are new, but like new to the industry kind of. And, and helping them grow up and take off and bring in new people. How many people are in the show today looking for jumping spiders and stuff like that? Yeah. So, you know what I mean? It's it's like, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And and I love to even just talk to the kids who came for jumping spiders and then maybe see, see a snake that right. I have that I like or whatever. So. Okay. Uh, just real quick before we wrap up here. Uh, the crowds at the show. You've been show, doing shows a while now, <laughs> as yeah. I have been. Yeah. Um, I, I love to see the, the diversity in the crowds that once wasn't there from an age standpoint, from a racial background standpoint. Heck, there's women at the shows who are not yeah. there with a the guy. Yeah. They're there because they're into the animals. Absolutely. Um, so for the, for the keepers out there who you know watch the, the, the podcast but haven't been to a show, describe the, the show scene to them. Oh, man. Well, the first thing is if you come to one of these shows, like a national show, that's where you're going to get the ultimate version of what you're talking about. Right. Because a lot of local shows are like local people breeding local things. Right. And they're all the people in your hometown. But if you go to like a, you know, a larger show, it's, uh, there, there is no, there is no, that's a reptile guy anymore, you know, or girl or right. whatever. It just doesn't exist anymore. So the beautiful thing about it is some of the most fun conversations I have is where you've connected really deep with somebody on a reptile level. And then you step back and you go, wait, you play for the NFL? No way. You know what I mean? Yeah, we're like, just reptile dudes vibing on reptile stuff. I'm, I'm a steel industry guy, right. you know what I mean, from Pittsburgh right. or whatever. Like, what the heck, you know? Yeah, and so it, it could be, like, businessmen and total degenerates and, you know, and like, just everybody all from all over the place coming together with this, this commonality of the love of the animals. 
you know? And so you, and one thing I always loved about what you do that I think you guys could probably learn from is that you uh, are, are so kind and supportive to everybody all the time, letting them be them, but also helping them to become the best version of them, you know? Wow. Thank so, you. Thank you no, for kind I, words. I think that's, I think that's uh, your bigger impact beyond any of the animals or businesses and stuff that you've done. So if you can learn to take a, a chapter from that, social media has blown up the industry as well, right. but it's uh, it also empowers, you know, poisonous people right. and things like that. So, yeah, I think if all of us keep building it together, it's just going to continue to grow and diversify and be this common ground where we can connect our artificial worlds with the natural world that all of us have that yearning to reconnect with in this day and age. All right. So I would be remiss if I let you get away without returning your kind words to me with some kind words to you. See, he, um, can't, he can't not do it. He can't not do it. <laughs> but, but seriously, you know, uh, there's all kinds of people who come through this hobby over, over time and over the years. Uh, but there's people who make it better for everybody else. And you're one of those dudes. So, Thanks. you know, take that. It's, it's, it's a real thing, man. I Thank appreciate you. you. Yep. I love you too, Gert. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, get it for Garrett Hartle, man. Uh, reach your reptiles. Please head, head over to Instagram. I'll love and support to Garrett. Now we have the legendary Uncle Mike Stefani next. Hey, oh, uh, man. Everyone. Appreciate you so much, buddy. All right. Thanks, Uncle Mike, Thanks, step Garrett. on up, buddy. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Mike. How you doing, my man? Is this chair going to be okay for you, Uncle Mike? Yeah, it'll be all right. Yep. All right, it'll guys. Give it right. up for Mike. It's so, uh, so funny. Mike monitors in the building. Yeah, yeah. There he is, guys. And he got all something right, in his hand, too. You good? Oh, of course yeah, he does. Yeah. There right, we go. Look, look at that. What do we got there, Mike? Uh, well, I got a uh, sulfur water monitor I just hatched. This is uh, the first. Well, it's not the second clutch I hatched, but... Um, I just wanted to bring it over here and say hi to Chad and stop in and say hi to everybody. And as always, Mike's defining Mike's monitors and look at that. Ship your reptiles, the baby. Fast shippers around, <laughs> man. You know it. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Let me check out this. Uh, yeah, there you go, man. Nice sofa right here. Yeah. Wow. I hear you've been yeah. wanting one. I've been hearing you wanting one for your uh, your office, so <laughs> I figured I'd bring a teaser over for you. <laughs> this brings me back to the days when we used to, uh, you know, do water monitors. We, we would buy them wholesale and then polish them up, tame them up. Um, we got them to the point where we could clap and they would come and we would whistle. And they knew to expect food. Um, some of the most intelligent reptiles Absolutely. in the hobby. Absolutely. All right. So what's happening over there at Mike's Monitor? I think you had a, a female digging down on social media like the other day. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I just, well, I had just gotten her clutch. That was um, Bumblebee, which is my best sulfur. And the so that was her second clutch. So her first clutch actually hatched two days ago before the show and i have to sell these so i didn't bring them but those are smokers banded really nice and i'm holding two of the best back hoping that i get a male and i'll breed that to bumblebee my female and i'm what i'm trying to do is line breed perfect banded yellow black yellow black perfect bandings and, and i'll get there but i'm working on them. all right so you're known for the water monitors what other monitor species are you working with uh uh, Varanus Mertensi, Merton's monitors. Right. I've, I've hatched out lots and lots of those. Coming Eye monitors. I've done all the Audatrias, tree monitors back in the day, if you remember yep. that. Uh, peach throats. Pretty much everything I've had, I've had some good success with. I kind of clicked with these animals. And, you know, we've been doing this a long time. But right. back then, we were learning all this stuff. So I'm actually to the point now where... Uh, it's working pretty good like a machine and I can expect what I expect and uh, and it's good for the hobby because like you were saying before you'd bring in imports and you'd clean them up right and I'm going a step further I'm taking them imports and turning them into real captive borns for the people out there and as you can see they're super tame and uh, that's what people get when they buy from Mike's monitors I mean you can not only tame but you can tell these animals thinking oh it's intelligent it's comfortable and it's surrounding this is a great pet. Absolutely. Yeah, it provides a great pet experience. Some wild caught monitor that's scared and freaked out towards life, it's not gonna give you the same kind of experience. So save your pennies. This is worth the extra money. Absolutely, absolutely it is. And uh, so this year, I've been invited to the International Herpetological Symposium to do a, a talk on the, the caging uh, setup that I've kind of developed over the last few years for these types of animals. Uh, it's a bare water bottom, and that gives them their security. 
a real simple setup with a, a cork tube, a bunch of holes drilled in there. So you can always monitor your 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 new baby and you don't have to tear apart his, you know, his enclosure to get them and scare them. So we're engaging that brain mm -hmm. and we're showing them that you're not a threat and he has all his safety and husbandry covered, which makes them settle in because as babies, you know, they're afraid of everything. Right. Yeah, everything wants to eat them and they know that. So when the big gorilla, uh, <laughs> you know, it becomes at them really friendly. If they like this face, when the cute little people go out and buy these, that anyone will like them. So, um, so I think the, the, the water monitor thing has evolved from keeping water monitors to now understanding the, the inner oh, yeah. life, yeah. The, the brain of the water monitor. Um, and, and I think it's a growing part of the hobby where folks are beginning to realize these aren't just some you know animals that are programmed by nature. No. There's a thought process. There's thinking. There's dare I even say emotions evolve. No, no, I, I see it. I see it daily on a constant uh, you know basis. I'll have uh, people come into my room with animals that I have that just they know me from across the room, and it's crazy. It's like a dog. You know when it, when someone says oh, the dog don't like him, he might be a weird. You know. Yeah. My lizards, you can come in there, and some of them, and I can tell right away they're like. Okay, that guy's good, or they'll come in and I'll be like, "No, nah, I'm not coming near this guy." And it's really weird because it's the animal saying to me. So at that point, I won't say, "Oh yeah, just try to get him." If I can see my animal don't like him, we'll just stay separate a little bit, and you might go to the next one, and it likes you. So they're all individuals, like you said. They all have their own little personalities and clicks. Highly intelligent animals, and when you engage that part of their brain, you can really become socially. Um, together with them like like a long-term relationship with an animal that most people think are really just there you know but they're very intelligent they know what they want and they know what you know what's going to be good for them or not wow so i i, I love the the passion that you yeah. that you have for the animals and i am humbled the fact that you trust my company ship your reptiles to put these animals um to send these animals to your customers that you pour all this passion into that you trust us with that. Thank absolutely. You. No, absolutely. Like uh, going back, I can remember going, we go so far back. I used to put them in um, like Coke case boxes. You can't do that no right. more. Thank you. So when I, doing that. Yeah, when, <laughs> when I actually started shipping and I went with your, your company yeah. from the beginning and uh, man, I'm not going nowhere. And, you know, there's no reason to. So uh, I really appreciate what you guys do for me and my animals. And, you know, again, I make money. My wife likes me to make money. I don't care about money. Yeah. I care about my animals and people who are getting them. So you take you take good care of them animals and man, it ain't no better. Thank you very thank you very much. Terry, you re you receiving that? All right. That's your there's your race. No right. money in the involved. crowd speaks for itself. There you go. Yeah, yeah so yeah. that was that was Mike's wife saying that the staff is second to none. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for sharing your passion oh, with us. No Good problem, stuff, man. Chad, always, yes. always, brother. Give Thank it up for Uncle Mike Stefani, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Right, Thank you, Mike. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you. Right. All right. We know you know this. Right, this easy. this show is 93% ball pythons. We're not playing, okay? We got somebody who's hit it heavy in the ball python game. My man, sit down. BC balls. Have a good chat, my man, Chad Brown. What's, what's up, up man? Up, brother? What's up, man? We just uh, were chopping it up last night. Absolutely, we yeah, were. Yeah. Oh, man. So, welcome to the uh, the Trap Talk podcast. Thank you, MJ, for letting me host my little segments here. Um, so, we, we, we've had a, 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 monitor guy, a monitor guy. Now, we had a super dwarf or tick guy. Yeah. Now, you are the, the ball yeah. python guy, nice. which drives most of the hobby. Um, coach me up on your, your origins of the ball python thing for you. Uh, man, I, you know, I, I started, I've worked with reptiles for over 30 years. It's been a you know, long, long time. But like when I, when I started to get more serious about it and serious about doing it as a business model, I say that a lot. A lot of people don't like it, but it's just a fact. Um, you know, 2016 is when I direct my plans. Um, and then I didn't breed anything till 2018 because I wanted to take the time to learn everything there was to know so I could help the people to buy from me. And then, you know, 2018, 2019 was my first breeding season. I uh, had a good one. You know, 2020 was better. Had some incubation problems. But, I mean, you know, we always have adversity. We just right. went through it. Right. Uh, 2021 was outstanding. And 
2022 was our best year ever, and we're on pace to probably triple that this year. So it's just been incredible. Sounds like an uh, incredible run. Um, this incubator disaster that, yeah. that happened. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of folks get into the hobby and, and assume it's just going to be incredibly easy, yeah. and that kind of the hobby's going to lay down in front of them. Yeah. Um, tell me about that day. You know, we, oh, we, man. we, we well, walked into the facility and was. Well, you know, it wasn't any one day. It was it was a sustained, ongoing, just gut punch after gut punch the entire season because I had bought this new incubator and, uh, you know, two clutches would have just fine. The third one would have fully developed babies in the egg just dead. You know, then another one would have fine, then two in a row. Uh, you know, most of it was full clutches. Turned out the problem was the false wall in the incubator in the back was too close to the back. Didn't give the fans enough room, and it was blasting superheated air. We figured out the problem. Uh, and then the next year we had 100% hatch rate. This year we had 100% hatch rate. You know, so it's you know a good of good eggs that went in the incubator. You know, right. I mean, there's you got to throw away a few slugs or feed them to the rats anyway. The rats, <laughs> the rats like them. Really. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. well, well, I guess when I was doing ball pythons, I always had, always had monitor lizards. Yeah. So they got my bad eggs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's full, full circle, man. Circle life. <laughs> you know, we had our fire back in, in 2011. Um, and uh, this hobby has a way of, of humbling you sometimes. Oh, yeah. And bringing you, you know, to your to your knees. Man, and, it, it was close. Like, like that, that year... I'm a very positive person. I always stay positive, even in the face of adversity. But that year was, that was my low moment. And that was the moment where, like, the thought in my mind crept in of, can I do this? Can I do this? And, you know, if it wasn't for my family and my wife and everybody pushing me, and it says, look, this is something you love. You need to stick with it. And just came back bigger, stronger, better the next year. And, you know, we... We've put a lot of snakes on a lot of planes, thanks to you guys. So. Right on, right on. Uh, so uh, I want to say thank you for uh, you trusting us and trusting our company to deliver your animals. You're, you're, I sound, you know, you've got a bit of a, a social media business background, yeah. marketing background. Yeah, a little bit. Um, so I, I, I got a chance to have dinner last night. So oh, that's yeah. why I'm giving some <laughs> this information out. Um, so I, you know, I, you're you're a smart dude. You're a savvy dude. Obviously, you know there's choices out there so we as a company are just humbled that you would entrust us with these animals that you are now getting 100 percent hatch rate which is amazing uh yeah. from and uh getting those using us to ship them to your customers yeah man well i mean i appreciate the care that you guys give i, I can honestly say that i have not <clears throat> gotten the type of service from really any company within the entire realm of the industry that i've gotten from ship your reptiles and I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly loyal, uh, you know, and I feel like loyalty has its privileges. You guys have taken care of me and I've taken care of you guys. Um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, we just, it, it just clicks. And, you know, when you've got a company that you work with that works so well, there's just no reason to complicate things. You know, I, I, I'm the world's worst at complicating things sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, there's no need There's no need to, you know, I'm, I'm a Southern guy and I always say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that, 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 that's the best way I can look at it. Uh, you know, you guys have been incredible. Uh, your insurance has been incredible. Uh, you know, and I just look forward to many, many more years of Shipping with you guys. Yeah. Right on. Thank you. This is your first Tinley show, correct? Uh, it is my first Tinley show. I've done the other NARBC shows. Uh, buying a, I mean, getting a table here has been about like buying real estate on the coast in New York, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I finally finally got in and, you know, it's been, it's been a great show. It's been a great first full day. The VIP period was good yesterday. And, uh, you know, look forward to the auction tonight. Let's raise a ton of money for US Art because without them, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. Uh, you know, you know that. I know that. I can't stand when people don't support US Art. Uh, so, you know, come out tonight if, you know, and trying to get everybody out to do the auction and let's go overpay for some stuff. Absolutely. So I will see you at the auction. Thanks for being on the podcast, man. Hey, thank you Good so much. Good rest of the show to you. Absolutely. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thanks, buddy. BC Balls, ladies and gentlemen, give it BC up. BC Balls, yes. All right. So listen, Chad. Um, I got one guy left. Uh oh. I may have just done one. It's okay. Let's get this back. <laughs> We're still connected, I hope. Here we go. Hold on. There, there we, we go. go. We're, we're back. Going. We're back. There we're we're back. back. All right. Um, I mean, what am I going to do, man? It's kind of obvious who this main event guest is, who, who's sitting right there in front of us, about to have uh, this last final one-on-one -on -one, uh, for this Tinley episode. But before we bring him on, man, I mean, 
What's your overall appreciation for the ball python community? In the ball python world, uh, I know some folks can get a little jaded with it, but it drives this space. Right. You know, the caging and rack manufacturers wouldn't be in, there wouldn't be the diversity, there wouldn't be the number of folks in that business without ball python folks. Right. Um, you know, uh, the, the betting folks. I think there's more betting inside ball python cages than there are in probably any other species cages. So right. uh, the, the rodent industry, all these pieces of the industry that are so important from a bedrock foundation parts of our industry, the ball python world benefits from that or, or benefits those parts of our industry. So right. uh, I, I know some folks may go to a show and be like, I don't want to look at any more ball pythons. And I can understand where they're coming from. But from the economic engine part of our hobby, it's a huge piece of it. 100%. Without further ado, um, the man behind Canova, the man behind Clutch. Here we have, to wrap it up, Justin Kabelka in the building. And I cannot believe he actually made it through the crowd and on time for this. I, I didn't think he was going to be here for it. But well, uh, he, he only took seven bodyguards to clear the crowd <laughs> and get him over here. He did it again. He did it again. Did it again. Sorry, watch the cable, buddy. All right, Justin, have a seat. They can still hear us. Okay. All right, here we go. Justin Kabelka. Hey, you have Chad Brown ship your reps. Oh, you might want to scoot up. I think we're a little far from the mic. You're right? good. No, we, can, we can pick it up. You're good, buddy. Good? All, right. All right, Justin. All right, man. So uh, you and I were over at your table a little while ago, and I was lamenting that the two shy guys have to play these roles yes. on, on social media. Um, yeah. I, I've watched some of your first uh, videos that you did back when you were a teenager. You look like you're in your, your bedroom. Yes. Yeah, so take me from that dude into where you are today, the different phases of yeah, personal growth. Sure. Not, not business growth, right. but the personal growth. Wow, so that original video that you're thinking about was in my dorm room in boarding school in Oklahoma. Okay, so the dorm was nice enough to say, listen, you have this obsession. We'll give you a little space. We had an empty room next to mine. We didn't have that many students that year. And they said, you can fill full of animals. Of course, I pushed it way too far to bring in rattlesnakes from outside. I would literally go out every day, have this, this route around campus, and look for animals I could bring into my little room. And it was amazing. But that was me. Then I started doing YouTube probably four years later, four or five years later. And the, night, the great thing about YouTube is that, yes, I'm a shy person, but there was nobody was watching. Right. So, you know, I did 100 plus videos with nobody watching. And then I started to get a little more comfortable with it. And now I can, I'm pretty, you know, I mean, I do okay. It's not my normal way of being, but I've learned to learn skill, mm -hmm. you know. I see you, you're, you're putting yourself out there a lot more lately too. Well, yeah. Well, there's not only the social media from a reptile perspective, but right. I, you know, I do broadcasting. Correct. And so some of my friends from back home are like, I would have never, ever pictured you doing this. It's like, well, yeah. you broadcast 100 football games, just like you did your 100 YouTube videos. The, the rhythm, the you know, the, the lingo, you get up to speed with it, you gain a sense of comfort. Um, so real quick story. So my very, very first game on ESPN. Um, you know, everyone who's watched a football game knows that the open, the two broadcasters are kind of shoulder to shoulder, yes. and they're going to talk about and set the scene for the game. Um, so my partner has been doing this for 30 years by this point, a very famous broadcaster by the name of Joel Myers. And they, they hand me the ESPN microphone, and it's got that ESPN thing around it. And up until that point, I had been able to keep my cool about myself. I look down, and instantly, the sweat starts pouring down my body. <laughs> And I'm so happy I've got a suit on so no one can see. Um, I can feel my throat starting to tie up, tighten up. So the producer in the truck says, okay, we're going to do rehearsal. So we do the rehearsal. As soon as it's over, Joel Myers turns to me and says, hey, man, you got to slow down and get control of yourself. Yeah. I'm like, Joel, I'm, I'm, I'm so nervous. I don't know what to do with myself. So we end up doing a couple more rehearsals. I get a little bit better. And then uh, at the final rehearsal, uh, Joel is going to, you know, pitch it back to the, the camera and he says, okay, so from historic Tiger Stadium, Joe Myers and Clay Brown. Clay Brown. And I'm like, who the hell is Clay? So that was enough to break the ice for me, for, for me to get able to be able to do my first live open. Um, but I could definitely understand the, the reps. You probably aspect. did it on purpose. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I think you actually just made a mistake there. But uh, the, the, the nerves and then the consequential uh, ability to feel comfortable in these moments uh, just comes with time. Yeah, you know, it's partly, I think, to, I've always had this mentality from the beginning is that when I started this business, right, it started a hobby, of course, that when I decided it was going to be a business, I didn't know what it would take, 
but I knew that I would become whatever it took. Right. Right. So if I have to be outgoing, I'll be outgoing. Maybe not in my private life, but in that moment, I'll be outgoing. If I needed to be more analytical about my parents, then I'll become more analytical because that's how much I was committed to the cause of my dreams. Right. And I, and I know that I'm sure you felt that way in football. What do I, what do I need to do to win? Right. right. Who do I need to become to win? I, I love that, that phrase. Who do I need to be to be successful? That's, a, that's an awesome way to put it. The reptile business, um, I've always said, is a great business training school. Particularly if you want to start off very small, as you almost everybody in the hobby does, yeah. you have to be in the production of the animals, uh, production of the feeders in some way. Um, you've got to run the back office, the financing, the accounting of it all. But you also have to become a marketer. You have to sell your animals. And so all the different segments of business that people go to business school to become a marketing major or an accounting major or a major in you know production or something. Um, we learn all those skills in the reptile business. And you know, from, a, from afar, it's always felt like you've mastered each step along the way. I've read lots of books at every step. Whenever I find myself out of my depth, first of all, I do thing I do is I just plunge in and just be like, listen, everybody's trying. I'm just going to try, you know, and then where is it not working? Where is it is working? What can I learn from other industries? And I just read a lot. Listen, listen to audiobooks. The great thing about snakes is that you have all this time on your hands cleaning cages right. and just try to try to learn. And um, it's, been, it's been the best like education ever. Yeah, I say the reptile business or the reptile industry has been the school of hard knocks in some way, but it's been the best business school I could ever have imagined because of all those segments you're forced to master, because of the ups and downs, because of the hard times, the incubator malfunctions, the fire at my facility. How do and you're you selling a product grow? that most people are afraid of. Right. Right? So talking about like a typical audience, I mean, I know we're, we're preaching to the choir sometimes when it comes to the reptile industry, but you have to explain to somebody... Um, why they should care about the species, train them how to take care of it, hopefully kind of guide their success. And in my in my case, you not only have to train what species, but what genes they should, they should care about. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of art where you're just customer education, which I think a lot of businesses don't have that. They just go into a segment, like I'm gonna join a pizza franchise where everybody loves pizza. And everybody knows how to eat pizza. <laughs> yes. right, but we have to train our customers on how to be successful right. in this hobby that they're giving us money for. Right, and in a way, we're gonna have to train them in a way to do what we do and be our own competition. competitors, right. right? You know, And so, you know, how, how can we teach them how to ship their animals successfully with shipping reptiles? How can we teach them how to successfully you know, find their own customers and everything. And it's like this, it's, it's really interesting synergy. It's a very unique business. No true parallels in it with anybody else, I think, but I like to pull from different other segments and say, well, we're similar to these guys and similar to these guys in different ways. So everybody knows you as the, you know, the, the king of the ball Python world, but you've got a new venture going as well. Yeah, Clutch, you mm -hmm. know, which is, fits right in hand. It's basically the same thing we're talking about, how, I was trying to be whatever I had to be to be successful. We came across this wall, up against this wall, we have a great staff, a great team that came over like the best. And it's taken a lot of years to get there to find those people. And we kind of came to a place where, okay, we have a great staff, but all the knowledge is here. And like, okay, well, they're, they're incredibly smart, but they don't have the tools. And so we started working with the company to build an internal tool for Canova which is the full collection management that puts everything I know about all the histories of the animals and all the um, genealogies and lineages and the morphs and what to look for, puts it all into a program for my staff. That's why we did it. But then as it started to get good, I was like, this is going to be actually huge for everybody because the complexity of the ball python world specifically has become so high that the barriers to entry for the average person off the street is overwhelming. Right. Someone comes in, like they start hearing all these weird, the, the weird language. We talk about morphs, and they say, I, that's, that's Boba Pig, right? They walk yeah. away, right? So we're thinking if we have this program that basically empowers people to understand genetics, to understand the genealogies and everything, it's going to shorten that learning curve and maybe actually will help our industry in general. So I'm super excited about it. We're, we just launched a month ago. So. It, it, it's awesome. You know, the, yeah. the, the evolution of, of, of your company, which I follow from the very beginning to, to where you are now, um, it goes to, to, to literally demonstrate your ability to master the next thing up. 
you know, to do the research, figure it out, you know, plan it, market it, release it, follow up customer service of it all. It's, it's been a, a pleasure to watch you grow your company. Yeah, thank you. It's an amazing journey. I, I love it. I love it. It's, I think the, this journey is actually more fun than the results for me. That's, that's, that's the key. Well, idea. I think that, 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 now, that yeah. speaks to the, the passion because the people who are results based um, so often, they want to get to a result and they don't join the journey along the way. They don't take the lessons and learn from it. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's fun to hear you reference it in that way because that speaks to the, the passion involved. So, um, you know, uh, obviously I'm sure folks are like, oh my gosh, you didn't ask him a single ball Python question. Oh, God. it's plenty of time for that. <laughs> there's, there's plenty of podcasts for that. <laughs> no, I, I'll do one. Okay. I, I'll do one. Um, what is the base morph that you would Base your collection on if you were starting the ball pythons today. I feel like that's that's so tough. I still think pies. I think pies, and I and I say that because pies are the morph that on the street everybody goes says, "Oh wow." We have trained ourselves to know what's rare and what's expensive and what we like, but I will never forget pies are the I said the pies are the gateway drug for ball pythons. You see one, you're like. Oh wow! That how's that possible? It looks so fake, um, and then you fall in love with all the other stuff. I'd go right back to pies. I think that's for me. That's what it was. That's my first pie. I remember specifically where I was as a Repticon Atlanta, Cypress Creek reptiles had a pie on the table, and the rest is history. Here we are now today, twenty years later. I saw the pie mail that Pete Call bought yes. to start the whole pie thing within the hobby, um, and I could not convince uh, Cameron from Bushmaster Reptiles to let me buy it. I, when he brought it over from Africa, I said, Pete had already claimed it. Uh, so even though I offered twice as much money, I, I couldn't get it. And, uh, you know, that now I wonder how many pies have been pr produced uh, at this point in the hobby. I mean, hundreds of thousands, would you guess? Definitely in the high tens of thousands, at least. I, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to wrap my mind around that number. It's a lot. Okay. All and right. then to think about how many people, though, are now in the industry because of the exposure to that and other mutations that just trigger something in their head. And their head. Now have a love for this hobby like we do. It's yeah, amazing. fascinating. Yeah. Well, this was a good talk, man. Um, I, yeah. I, I love the elevated uh, business evolution kind of stuff and the personal evolution Same. of things. Um, I'm certainly different person in the reptile hobby now at 52 than I was at 22, than I was at 32. Heck, than I was 10 years ago at 42. Yeah. So I, I think we all have to grow and evolve in our own way. So it was great to catch up with you about that. Right. And uh, I would you know, be remiss if I did not say thank you for trusting your precious animals to ship reptiles. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So we have a question from the crowd, so I want to just ask real quick, why does the number one ball python breeder in the game, and yes, that's how I feel, you ship your reptiles? It's because of trust, honestly. It's trust. And all these years, that is number one to me. You know, I, I don't want to worry about, um, there's so many different things we have as far as overhead, be it the bedding or the rodents or the or the shipping or whatever. Those things that we can contract out, which we do bear on most rodents mostly. It's, when you have an amazing collection, it comes down to trust. And I want to worry about other problems. You let you guys worry about the shipping, you know? And, and that's that's everything to me. I, I, uh, I know it's in good hands. Well, that's the way we, we want to think about it. We want to be your business partner. We don't want to be somebody who can, kind of just for hire. I want to be your business partner so you can focus on doing the amazing things that you do. We'll take that headache away from you, and we'll do what we do at a very high level. And together, we'll form this great partnership. It's a, a long-lasting partnership. How long is it now? 10 years? Uh, it's got, I think it was 12. Yeah. Almost 12. Yeah. Yeah, from day one, pretty, pretty much. We yeah. signed on. It's been amazing. We appreciate Thank you, sir. You I appreciate much. it. Thanks Thank for being on the you. podcast, man. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Yay! Thank you. Oh, Chad, what a great time it's been. Um, listen, I, I'm going to make this simple. My wrap-up question to you before we end tonight's uh, show is, uh, what's the importance behind these relationships that you've built over the years? I mean, let's let's kind of talk about that. Like, what's? I feel like there's been a huge importance to you if you've taken care of your people. And I feel like this is why we've had the people sit down with you today and give you all the props and respect. But, I mean, how important is the relationship to you, you feel like? Um, now... I'm not sure if this is just who I am or the fact that, you know, I play professional football. So I'm not trying to squeeze every dollar or penny out of anybody. Um, and, you know, you are allowed to make a mistake as my customer. And I don't want that to cost you. So um, I'm willing to count the shipment. I'm willing to uh, allow an insurance claim to go through. And I know my staff is going to tell me for saying this. That maybe doesn't meet all the criteria for that. 
because I want you to have a great experience by using right. my company. Um, so I'm willing to bite the bullet and forego my own dollars so then you can be successful, so you can have a great experience. Um, you know, so folks sometimes make mistakes with things like heat packs and uh, shipping under improper conditions, and sometimes the outcome may not be very good. But I don't want that one experience where you may have a well-intended mistake to turn you away from the hobby, or turn you away from reptiles, or turn you away from using me as a company. Right. Um, so I want to be able to build a long-term relationship with you. And within that, grace is a part of that. And as Justin just talked about, trust is a part of that. Yeah. I think Justin can lay his head on his pillow at night knowing that I'm never going to ever try to screw him over under no circumstance. That's a huge part. And, and, and so in this hobby, there's some folks who will do you wrong. And that's unfortunate. But I don't want to ever be those, one of those guys. And so whether it's someone as big on the scene as Justin or it's the, the military mom who needs to ship little Timmy's turtle from Tennessee to Texas, um, I got your back. I'm here to help you out. My staff is here to help you out. That's the way we look at this business. We are here to help you out. And if you've got an actual business, I want to be your business partner for a long time. Other than NARBC, what shows can people look forward to seeing Shipping Reptile Booths? Like, what, what's what's on the agenda? I mean, are we, are we talking any of the West Coast shows, like Anaheim, Super Shows, anything like that? Because I'm a, I'm a West Coaster, and I would love to see you guys out there. Okay, yeah. So we are at the – we're one of the, the – the, title sponsors, the key sponsors for the Reptile Super Show. Shout out to Rami. Yes, what's up, Rami? Thank you for letting me do that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, we'll be in Pomona. We'll be in Anaheim. We'll go out to Daytona and do and do the uh, the Daytona Beach Expo as well. So, um, you know, we are at most large shows, maybe not vending at every single large show, um, but there's a large show for the NRIBC, for the Reptile Super Show, like I said, Daytona. We will be there. Any of these shows that we really view as a destination show, people are going to get on the plane and travel to that show. We are there to help you ship your animals home and also to spread the good word about shipping reptiles. Nothing but great words spread on this episode. Chad, it's been an honor, man. Um, and I got to say, I mean, hopefully someday I could actually get you on the show one-on-one -on -one for like a good hour, buddy. I mean, listen, I know I know your time is precious, but I have so many questions still to ask you. And I just got to say, just this moment with you means a lot. Thank you for believing in me. Thank you for taking the time to let me host this at your uh, booth. But, man, I wish you nothing but success in this industry. The real OG is not just a gimmick. It's the real name behind what you have going on. So, Chad Brown, thank you so much. Shout Excellent. out to the entire Ship and Reptiles team. Susie, um, AJ, Terry, all you guys. You guys Sarah, are awesome. Sarah, Jordan, name them all. All of, you know, the whole kit guy, the crew, the whole crew, Andrew, Jackie, Angel, Sean. the whole crew. Sean. Sean, yes. Yeah, guys. Craig, the whole crew, absolutely. Thank you, guys. Listen, enjoy your NARBC Tinley weekend. We got to shut things down and get ready for US Arc auction because i can tell you what chad's gonna come with some serious heat probably so you don't want to miss it make sure you go to the usa auction have a good night guys we'll see you guys next time peace thanks buddy thanks it's good stuff man. Good show, man. thank yep. you so much